Uh, if you've got your Bibles at home, the book of Titus, as you'll remember from last week, is in the New Testament. All the T books are together in the New Testament and they're organised in alphabetical order. Just for your convenience, I've no idea why they did it that way, but they did. Uh, so we're in the book of Titus, chapter 1, and we're reading verses 5 to 9. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone. And as I directed you to appoint elders in every town, someone who is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of wildness or rebellion. For an overseer, as God's manager, must be blameless, not arrogant, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good. Sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he'll be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's a sermon outline there and you might have printed it off at home. Uh, but before we get to the sermon outline, hopefully uh, the next slide is our memory verse and uh, you can see there what I'm encouraging you to learn. There are a lot of verses there, aren't there? Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14. But Drinda contacted me this week and said, how about you encourage us to learn it in little bite-sized chunks? And so that's why I've put in those yellow markers. So you can learn these verses over seven weeks by just devouring a small chunk at a time. Kind of like when I eat dinner sometimes. You just want to take a little chunk and learn it. So let me encourage you to learn Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14. It's really at the heart of what this letter is all about. We're going to get there in a couple of weeks. But please, let me encourage you to think through learning that. If you'd like a copy of that breakdown, please let me know and I'll print it off with the markers in there and you can learn it in your own households. Well, let me tell you uh, whether or not you've been paying attention, and sometimes we just want to switch off from the news, don't we? Uh, leadership has been an issue in our community for a while, hasn't it? At every level of our society, uh, at a national level, uh, leadership has been provoked as a discussion topic by COVID, by climate, by contracts for submarines, and whether or not we're offending people. Uh, at a state level, it's been an issue as borders shut, as mandates are issued, as changes take place. It's even going to be an issue at a local level, isn't it? Because we've got local council elections later on this year. Issues around leadership. Uh, and, and really, at a state level, it's been at a fever pitch as we've changed premiers, hasn't it? Now, I had to Google how to pronounce his last name because I think I was pronouncing it improperly. But the rise of Dominic Perrottet has been really interesting to read about. Now, let me be open and personal. I found the fall of Gladys quite sad. I thought it was a sad episode, but I found the discussion about Dominic's rise quite striking. It's not as if he's an unknown, is he? I mean, if you've been watching the daily press conferences, he's always been there, hasn't he? He's been a Member of Parliament for a while. He's been Minister for Finance and Industrial Relations and Treasurer, Deputy Leader. And now at the age of 39, he's our youngest ever Premier. I feel like I've wasted my life. But what was striking for me in the discussion about his rise to leadership was how confused we are as a society about leadership and what it involves. Oh, wherever you turned, you had the usual dissection. What school did he go to? What's his religious affiliation? How many kids does he have? Which faction does he belong to? But as we read all those things, we should have noticed that as a society, we're just floundering when it comes to thinking about leadership. And we're so contradictory. On the one hand, you've got all those people who say, stay out of our private lives, but when it comes to our leaders, we want to know what they do privately. How many kids does he have? Which school did he go to? What denomination does he belong to? That's one irony. On the other side, you've got all those who supported him who are suddenly trying to whitewash every Twitter post that he ever put because they might be embarrassing. All it did was reveal that we're confused about leadership, what we want how we gauge it, 
Who we choose, what's the measure? Thankfully, God's not confused, is he? God doesn't flail around or flounder when it comes to leadership. And as we unpack this little private letter, we'll see why leadership is so important. But at this point, at this point, we're going to see that leadership matters and that God is very clear about who should lead his people. Let me pray. Father, thanks for our leaders, uh, especially today. Uh, we want to be praying for those who lead us politically and who lead us in a health sense. Uh, Father, please sustain them. Uh, please provide them with a deep and abiding knowledge of the one who leads the whole universe, your son Jesus. And Father, as your people sitting here today, please show us your clarity about the leadership of your people a leadership that begins with the overseer and shepherd of our souls, Jesus Christ, and goes right down to every part of your household. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Paul wrote to Titus. We looked at that last week. Remember, we had a series of questions when you come to a letter. Who wrote it? Who got it? Why did they write? When did they write? Uh, last week, we saw that Paul wrote it. Uh, he's a slave of God, an eyewitness to Jesus up there in verse 1. He's got a mission for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. He's got a message that Jesus lived, died, was buried and rose for your sins according to the scriptures, that that will transform you, that that's what God has revealed, that that's God's perspective on life and life is bigger than just surviving and breathing. Life is eternal and God's people reflect God to the world. Titus He's the recipient. He's a younger Christian man whom Paul has a close relationship with. Uh, put simply, he's Paul's troubleshooter. Him and Timothy are men sent by Paul to do various jobs. But why did Paul write and when? Why did Paul write and when? There are other two questions when you come to dealing with the letter. And as we go further into the letter in verse 5, We'll get a glimpse of that. I'm at point two on the outline. Look at verse five. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone. And as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. Well, we know who wrote it. We know who got it. And now we're told the when and the why. Paul's left Titus in Crete. Our kids, if you've got your maps there, look for Crete there. It's a little island. I'm told it's about 150 kilometres long. Paul does visit Crete. In Acts chapter 27. But if you go back and look at that, it's not really a circumstance where he could set up a church. After all, he's in chains. He's a prisoner of the Romans. It doesn't seem conducive to a church planting expedition. And Titus is nowhere to be seen in the whole book of Acts. So we've got a locality, Crete, but we don't have a time frame. The best bet most people seem to be able to make is that this happens sometime after the book of Acts. Uh, the, after the book of Acts, Paul is released from jail in Rome and it seems that he attempts to head towards Spain on another missionary journey in line with his mission and message. When we read the book of Titus and 1 Timothy and they're written around the same time, he seems to be moving fairly freely and he's not a prisoner like he mentions in 2 Timothy. That seems to be the occasion he writes these letters to his two troubleshooters, Timothy and Titus. Timothy who's sent to Ephesus, Titus who's left in Crete. Now, to Timothy is the last of these three letters. It was probably written fairly close to his death and Paul, we reckon, died around about 67 AD. He was probably released from jail in Rome around 61, 62 AD, and so there you go, we've got a very precise time frame, don't we? <laughs> Somewhere from 61 to 67 AD. But we've got no idea about where Paul was when he wrote it. But we know the job. Did you pick it up there in verse 5? We know the job. He leaves to Titus, the troubleshooter. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone. And as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. Titus, here's your job. It's a job that Paul gives him. 
And behind the commission of this job is all the authority of Paul, who is appointed by God. And the job is very clear. Get things organized in God's household in Crete and appoint elders in every town. Now, elders could mean old men. That seems like a strange command. Go around and appoint old men in every town. I mean, they're already there, aren't they? (laughs) They don't have to appoint them. They're already there. But when we look down a little further, see there in verse 7, he uses another term, overseer. And if you're listening to what Brian read from Acts 20, those two words occur there, elders and overseers, and they're interchangeable. Basically, Titus has been left by Paul in Crete to get God's mob organised and to appoint a leadership, leaders in every town who are to have oversight over God's people in that place. Simple job, hey. But I think we need to notice this before we go any further. God's design for his people is for them to have leaders. That much is clear, isn't it? God's design for his people is for them to have leaders. At no point in the history of God's people are they without some form of leadership. They always have leaders. We saw that in the book of Ephesians. The image there is of a body. That's what God's people are described as, and it's a body with a head. Who's the head in Ephesians? It's Jesus, isn't it? And then under Jesus, there are other people in Ephesians 4 who exercise authority under him so that God's people are built up. And so that's the pattern we have. I hope you picked that up in the reading from 1 Peter. Jesus is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And under him, there are under shepherds appointed. Paul, who's given a command, who then delegates it to Titus, who's given a command, who then delegates it to the leaders, the elders who are appointed in every town. So there we go. We've got who wrote the letter. We've got who received the letter. We've got where it was written or a rough time frame and we've got why it was written. It leaves a very important question. Who's Titus to appoint? Who's he to appoint to leadership? And thankfully God is very clear in verses 6 to 9, isn't he? I'm at point 3 on the outline. Paul says, if anyone is, and then he lists a series of key attributes. These are the necessities. If someone displays these attributes, then they can be considered for this position. Notice that there's no process. They've got to go to this Bible college and they've got to sit these exams and they've got to do X, Y, Z. It just talks about the type of person. And the starting point is character, isn't it? The starting point is character. Look there in verse 6. Someone who is blameless. Now it's repeated again in verse 7, isn't it? Look down there in verse 7. For an overseer as God's manager must be blameless. Character is the starting point. Someone's conduct established in who they are. Their character. They've got to be blameless. I want you to pause there. Notice he doesn't say sinless. A pretty quick job if that's the starting point, isn't it? (laughs) Uh, That job is reserved for one man only, isn't it? He's the shepherd. He's sinless on our behalf. But the under-shepherds are to be blameless. To be blameless. It means people who have a public reputation with no mark on it. People who have a public reputation as a Christian man with no mark on it, both within God's people and in the wider community. Well, how are you to judge that? How are you to gauge that? What what, what are the key performance indicators to work that out? Well, do you you notice where Paul goes next to explain where to judge that, where to measure it? Look there in verse 6. Someone who is blameless... The husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of wildness 
or rebellion. How do you gauge it? You go and sit in their lounge room. You go and sit at the kitchen table. The examining ground for an elder's blameless character is his home life. On the one hand, Paul says very clearly that an elder must be faithful to his wife and be known for this, to have a reputation for this. I don't think he's saying they've got to be married. And there's a lack of clarity about the issue of divorce. But he must be at least this, faithful to his wife. On the other hand, he's got to be showing that he leads his own household. Did you see that there? In his relationship with his children so that they follow his leadership. Now, I don't think Paul is saying that all of the kids need to be believers. But what he is saying is that those children who live under his roof follow his leadership. Follow his leadership. Now, I know if I wrote an article about this and said, listen, this is how we meant to pick our leaders and got it published in the Sydney Morning Herald, there'd be a few letters to the editor, wouldn't there? How dare you shove your nose into our bedrooms? How dare you overstep that private public divide? How invasive. (laughs) But did you notice in verse 7 why this is God's design? Look there in verse 7 with me. For, that means here's the reason, for an overseer as God's manager must be blameless. Uh, God's manager there is the one who looks after God's household, like we saw in Ephesians. The logic is very clear. If an elder is not blameless in his own household, how can we trust him with God's household? If an elder is not blameless in his own household, how do we trust him in God's household? That's the proving ground of his competency in his little church at home. In his little church at home. To be blameless in his own household is to have the character that can be trusted with God's household. And then he unpacks what that looks like. Notice again that he goes to blameless and then gives us a number of attributes. Uh, There are five negatives and six positives. Look there in verse 7 with me. For an overseer as God's manager must be blameless, not arrogant, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, Holy, self-controlled. I'm going to stop there. Well, the five negatives and the first five positives shouldn't really be a surprise. We'd expect that of any Christian, wouldn't we? It's a really good reminder that the character of the elder is a godly character, which we expect of everyone. Look there in verse 1, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. The striking aspect of the first five negatives is how they target selfishness. How they target selfishness. Each of those areas with a knot in front of it are areas of incredible self-centeredness, focusing on me at the expense of everyone. And the leader of God's people can't be that way inclined. The elder, the leader of God's household, is fundamentally other person-centred in their relationship with God, and so in their relationship with God's household. And that comes out in the first five of the positives because there they focus on the bigger picture. Don't be indulgent, don't be self-focused, but be so fixated on serving others and God's household that you are constrained to goodness. Be so fixated on serving others and God's household that you are constrained to goodness. And it's the last attribute that places it in the biggest picture. Look at verse 9. Holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. We've really returned to Paul's main mission, haven't we? the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. An elder is to be someone who holds on to the faithful messages taught 
there to be men of God's word who believe deeply that Jesus died, was buried, rose for our sins according to God's word. And it's transformed their own life. An elder is to be fundamentally conservative in the best sense, conserving the message of the truth that saves. Remember how Paul described his own job back there in verse 1? The knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And that's the type of person who leads God's household in proclamation and in practice. And do you notice that that's spoken? It's not hidden. Do you notice that in verse 9? So that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. That's why the reading from Acts 20 was so important. Paul's there chatting to the elders of the church in Ephesus and he's putting flesh on their job description and he's farewelling them and he reminds them of their task. Did you listen carefully? They're to feed God's sheep and they're to keep the wolves away. Put simply, feed sheep, shoot wolves. Feed sheep, shoot wolves. And it's the same for both. That Jesus died, was buried and rose for our sins according to the scriptures. God's truth in God's word to feed sheep and shoot wolves. That's a position of care, isn't it? That's what this leadership is all about. Care for the truth of God's word. And so care for God's household. The elder is to be focused on caring for God's household by teaching them the truth as God has revealed it in his word and it is proven in their own lives, the way in which that care has transformed them. Well, Titus has got a job, hasn't he? Paul's left him in Crete to get the, the, the household of God straightened out and chiefly to do that by putting in place elders. And we're given a clear description of what that means. It begins and is established in character. The elder must be blameless. The proving ground is their own household, involves other attributes so that the household of God is cared for, knows the truth and so reflects it. And that raises a whole concern. Well, what are the things threatening? Are we going to deal with that next week? But let me close by making some observations. I'm at point four on the outline. I began by talking about how interesting, and you guys might snore at this point, I can understand that, I'm a political tragic, how interesting it is to see the debate about leadership in our media. Everything from whether Mr Morrison is going to Glasgow right through to Mr Perrottet's Catholicism and the influence of having six kids on state policy. All it's done is reveal how confused we are about what we need in our leaders. God is not. God is very clear. And we've seen an expansion of that as Paul writes this letter to Titus. And you'll see there that I want to close with a number of very short observations about what that means for us. The first is very clear, all of us. Remember we finished the letter last week, <laughs> went to that last phrase, which was plural. So it's private correspondence between one man and another with an application to the whole mob. That means this description of what leaders need to look like applies to us. It's not just a description in Crete. It's a prescription for God's people everywhere. And so we need to pay attention to this as we pick and appoint our leaders. Secondly, leaders are a necessity. It's unavoidable in God's word. <laughs> The leadership begins with Jesus under God. Oh, there's all sorts of debate. Should we have one leader? Should we have plural leadership? All sorts of debate about the mechanics, but this much is clear. God's people have leaders. And it starts with Jesus, the shepherd and overseer of our souls, and is delegated to under shepherds. It's delegated wisely and carefully. But that understanding is really important for us to hold on to in a world that is increasingly anti-authoritarian. Leaders have a place in God's people. 
And we need to think about that in terms of our culture here as we live in the culture out there. And notice the role of leaders. It's for the care of the household, not for the glory of the resume. It's for the care of the household. And that leads to the third observation. The role of leaders amongst God's people is to care for the household of God. They are there for the benefit of the mob. Feed the sheep, shoot the wolves. That's the role of the leaders of God's people and it's exercised through careful teaching of God's word. There's care everywhere here. Please keep encouraging your leaders to do that to carefully proclaim the word of God. Notice on a side point that Paul doesn't spend any time here talking about the way in which the sheep deal with the shepherd, the leaders. Notice that that doesn't come in here. That comes in in other parts of the Bible, Hebrews 13, 17, Ephesians 4. But really Paul's focus here is that the leaders of God's people care for God's people by proclaiming the truth that leads to godliness. So we've got to pay attention to character. That's the fourth observation. Character is crucial. Blameless. Blameless. God hasn't talked here about life experience, has he? God hasn't talked here about their outgoing, extroverted personalities. God hasn't talked here in terms of their immense capacity for work or their ability to handle administration. It's character. Character matters that in their own lives, the knowledge of the truth has led to godliness. And I think that is crucial because they show that the knowledge of the truth transforms Please pay attention to character when you choose your next leader. Hopefully it's a while away. But character is crucial. Can I also add as an aside here that we are in a climate of online character, aren't we? And Titus didn't have the internet. We do. And so as we appoint our leaders... We need to not only examine their households, but their online personas. And leaders need to be competent. They need to have displayed the character in their competency in their own home. You examine the lounge room before you examine the lectern. You sit down and have a meal with them before you listen to the back copies of their sermons. You check their character so that they practice what they proclaim, so that they are as careful in their private life as they will be in the care of God's household. And they must be capable of proclaiming it. Not a gifted orator, not brilliant with words, but faithful, clear, consistent, capable, a communicator of care with God's truth. Now, from personal experience, I'm so appreciative of the people who've led me. I'm so appreciative of the leaders that God has placed in my life through many years. I'm reminded as I read a passage like this of God's goodness in doing that and that all of them displayed that care, feeding the sheep and shooting the wolves. And it leads me to this point. I want to pray for leaders like this. Leaders who have the character that displays they know the truth and they've been transformed so that they lead God's household in the same. Let me pray in line with that. Father, thanks for Jesus. Thank you that he is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Thank you that he is our leader, that he is our king, our Lord, our saviour. Father, thank you that he has appointed leaders across time and place, geography and culture whose character is to be blameless, to lead your household in the same, to know the truth 
that leads to displaying you to the world, to know Jesus and to show Jesus. Father, please give us those kinds of leaders. Please help us as all of your household to support those leaders in prayer. And Father, please help us to be so transformed by the knowledge of the truth that people meet you daily through us, through being shown Jesus, through being introduced to him in your word. In his name we pray. Amen. Any questions? Ebony. Yeah, terrific question. So um, repeating these questions for those of us who are enjoying this at home. Uh, number one, are we to all aim for the attributes outlined for elders here as God's people? And secondly, what about your past? Uh, if there's a tarnish there in the past, uh, what does that mean for your position of leadership now? Have I got that right? Ebony's nodding ahead. Terrific. Um, I think the first question is yes. If you read through that list... Uh, we are all meant to be that, okay, because that is the display of the knowledge of truth that leads to godliness. What happens when we appoint elders is we take someone from their day-to-day -day job and put them aside to do the job of feeding us and keeping the wolves at bay. But we should expect nothing more of an elder than we expect of people in the pew, okay? We're all the same in those expectations because we're all displaying God's character to the world. The one area that might be different is the capability of public speaking, public preaching. Okay, that might be the one area, but that doesn't mean that we all shouldn't be holding on to the faithful messages taught. Okay, does that answer the first question? So I'm getting a nod for the cameras at home. Terrific. Second question, what about your past? The great thing about being someone who knows Jesus is that we are saved completely and completely and utterly transformed in God's sight when we understand and live with Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. So we're told in the book of Revelation, I think it's Revelation 7, that uh, John looks and sees, and there are all these people, sorry, I might cry at this point, all these people in heaven who are dressed in white because they've been bathed in the blood of Jesus. And as we saw from the book of Hebrews, that's us now. And so that's why I was very careful earlier on to say there might be a lack of clarity about husband of one wife, what that means, okay? So there's a broad range of opinion within the church about that, and that seems to be the key area, uh, marriage, okay? Because marriage is a reflection of the covenant relationship between God and his people. But um, I think if you take the passage as a plain reading, I think we're being told very clearly that the knowledge of the truth transforms you. We can have those discussions about leadership later on, and I think it works at different levels within the community. So leadership of the whole household might be different to leadership of a Bible study group. They're in the same ballpark, but and we're looking for similar attributes, but, but we might be thinking on different levels there. So it's one that you want to deal with case by case. And uh, I know some dioceses make a rule for everyone and some don't, um, but I want us to start at that base level. When you come to Jesus and he fixes your brokenness, he makes you whole and you are completely transformed. You now just got to get used to it. Yeah. Does that answer your question? That's a thumbs up. So I've gone from a head nod to a thumbs up, okay, at home. 